These are 10 of the rarest conditions in the world and the stories of the people and families living with them. Did you know that there are conditions that both cause bones to disappear and muscles to turn to bone? But what is it like to live with one of the rarest conditions on Earth? You can't leave your heart at home, but I possibly could. The feeling of being attached to someone else is weird. And what are these rare conditions that have puzzled doctors and turned people's lives upside down? Three, one, go! Come with us as we show you some of the incredible stories about people who, despite being dealt a difficult hand at birth, are making their way through life in inspiring ways. The best way to deal with haters is to use the hate to lift yourself up. A lot of people push things into the future like, oh, I'll get to it eventually, like I'll learn to do this eventually. But for me, it's like if I want to learn to do something, like now's the time to do it and I do it now. Starting with Levi, his condition is so rare that there are only 30 cases of it worldwide. I'm Levi Christopher and I'm one in a million. My age is 11. I am 36 inches, something around there. 38 inches. My condition is James medical cognitive dysplasia. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> There's about 30 known cases worldwide. There's five genetically confirmed cases in America. It's a very rare form of dwarfism. The body does not process calcium like it should. The bones get bendy and grow crooked. We call them wonky bones. He wears these safety goggles to protect his left eye. He has optic nerve atrophy. We take Levi to see many different specialists. We see about eight different specialists. Hi, Levi. Hi. How you doing, man? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. You brought your mother along this time? <laughs> You didn't fly up by yourself this time? No. Oh. When I was first given the diagnosis that Levi had Janssen's metaphyseal chondrodysplasia, the doctor came into the hospital room and said, I need you to sit down. And he sat me down and he told me what, that Levi had Janssen's. And at first I said, are you sure? Because we had had several misdiagnoses. And he said, yes, we're sure. It's been genetically confirmed by a blood sample. And I was relieved to have knowledge of what he had. But then it made me sad because the more that the doctor explained what was going to happen, it was hard. It, it sounded very painful. And I just knew at that moment that I was going to do everything I could for him to get the best quality of life for him. So, how's it going? Good. Any problems? Not lately, no. I've known Levi for eight years. I first met him when he was three. Levi has several problems. The most obvious ones are his height. 41 inches. And that won't have much of an impact on his life. But he has a scoliosis, which is a curve in the back, and that can potentially cause a lot of issues and will likely need to be surgically treated at some point. The most obvious deformities in his legs okay, ready? Go. will be managed probably until he's fully here. grown. So you're running pretty well too, really fast. Awesome. Good work. Good work. Let's go back in here. So you know what? I think your legs are looking pretty good. Do you think you can manage wearing a brace for a while? Give it a shot. Mm -hmm. If or, his back was straight, would it help the leg? Or? No. I'm just is wondering, do I wear it every night and every, every day? Or? Yes. Yes, we'd like you to. I know, yes. That's what I know. I'm worried about. Every once in a while, probably take it off. To yeah, yeah. You can, it'll run around or go swimming or yeah. play with your friends. Absolutely. You don't have to wear it then. Yeah. When I see Dr. McKenzie, I sometimes have to do x rays and other stuff like. Today, they had to do a mold for a back brace because my back is basically like a big S. Okay, can I spin you this way so I can take a peek at your spine real fast? Mm -hmm. 
He's not allowed to jump. He has to be very careful. He has neck instability, so a simple headlock could be catastrophic for him. How it makes me different from the other kids at school is I can't play contact sports because of my neck and my back. Levi's been known to get frustrated and upset. He tries to keep up with his peers, and he, and he can't keep up. I mean, just his height can sometimes prevent him from keeping up with his friends. Luckily, when I can't play, I'm used to it, so I'm like, okay, I'll just watch or whatever. Mostly my friends at school, they're like, okay, you can't do this. What else can we do? And we just think of something else that I can do. All right, you think we're good? I had a lot of questions. When we found out that Levi had Janssen's, I wanted to know what caused it. Was there a cure? And there's not a cure for Janssen's. Were there other cases? Were there other children that lived nearby? Levi! Why'd you let things go? Because it's fun. It's fun and he, he's just like us. We all have the same disease. Yeah. And Good point. It's called Janssen's. Janssen's metaphysical chondro dysplasia. Which they already know. I'm Nina Nazar and I'm the president of the Janssen's Foundation. When we realized that there was something wrong with the boys, you know, we got on the internet. That's when I came across Donna's blog and I, I remember clicking on the link and the first picture that popped up was Levi. It was like I was looking at myself, I was looking at my kids. I knew immediately, even before we got the genetic diagnosis, that this was the condition that the boys had. When you have a condition so rare, it's really important for the kids to get together. And as the boys themselves say, you know, they're like, we're like each other. So they play to each other's strengths and weaknesses. They know each other really well. Levi has lots of things to look forward in life. I hope that he will be an extremely functional young man who will have a very successful life. But he will have challenges along the way. My hopes for Levi in the future are that he, he grows up and he gets married and I always joke and say I want him to graduate high school, go to college and, and move out of my house one day. I want him to be a normal, ha happy, healthy kid. I want him to do as much as he can do. Levi, do you know why you're so special? Yes, because of my rare disease and there's only five genetically confirmed in America. You're one in a million. Yes, one in a million. While so many of the rarest conditions make people look different on the outside, Lauren's only outwardly showing difference is a small bag she must carry with her everywhere she goes. And that handbag is vital to keep her alive. I have a disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension, and um, I have a pump that pumps a, an experimental drug called remodulin into my body, and that is what is necessary for me to stay alive. Pulmonary hypertension is a condition that narrows the arteries and vessels to the heart. Without treatment, this can lead to extremely high pulmonary pressures and result in heart failure. There is not a cure. Um, they can only make us feel better. Um, they can never cure us and some people even become immune to the drug as time goes on, so this drug doesn't work forever and it doesn't work for everyone. I'm trying to push out all the air bubbles so that they don't get into the cassette. So I'm just connecting um, my tubing right now. So basically I'm just switching pumps to my new medication and then I um, turn this pump on so that it's running. So this is just trying to get to the fluid to fill up the tube so that there, there's no air in it. There's something particular about Lauren. Um, although she's shy and quiet, uh, she will say how she feels about things, but you have to pay attention because she'll only say it once. And if you don't hear her the first time, uh, you consider that opportunity gone. I try to listen to her very carefully now um, because what she has to say has a profound impact on me and everybody around her. There we go, this pump is on, so this is good to go too. 
And then I just have to clean everything up. This is a picture of Lauren's heart cap that she had, which says what her pressures are. And uh, this is also like a picture of Lauren's central line where it goes into her chest and straight into her heart, right here. This is Lauren when she was just a little baby. She was always running around with her pearls on. <laughs> oh Lauren, pearls in a diaper. That was Lauren. Lauren's father, Joe, also suffered from pulmonary hypertension. In 2010, he died at just 36 years old. When I was little, I really didn't know there was much wrong with my dad because he was very resilient. He never seemed sick to anyone. Joe was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension when he was 18. He never really let it get in the way of what he did. He found a way to adapt. It, could this be genetic? And they said, no, it's idiopathic. Um, it happened just, it was his luck. So no, it never even crossed my mind until I started having symptoms and wondering what it was. And luckily I had a great doctor that said, let's go check it out. He decided that she, in fact, needed a right-sided heart catheterization and she was diagnosed. I was told that life expectancy, I was actually shocked by this, because I guess it's hard to hear, was one to five years. Um, without treatment, I was told one to two. Um, but she does have treatment. But I do think that that's a very individual uh, thing for each patient. However, I, Lauren's been sick a really long time. I, she's been sick since she was a little girl, even though we didn't have her diagnosed. And I think that that's played quite a big toll on her body, um, not being oxygenated the way that it need to. So, I mean, I don't know what that's going to do for Lauren's life expectancy. I would hope to think that within her lifetime that we're going to find a cure and that it won't be like that. And then typically you have to put the tube in a circle. It's kind of like a stress loop so that if it gets pulled on, um, it doesn't just kind of like rip out. I keep it in my purse all day long. Sometimes I take it off when I go to sleep. It depends how annoyed I am. Um, but yeah, I usually roll up the tubing in my purse and just keep it there. People really don't notice if it's in my purse, so. I guess I'm not scared because I feel like there's going to be a time where I'm gonna need to be scared and now's not that time. Like, I feel like I'm gonna know way beforehand before anything happens. Of course, that's naive and we never know what's gonna to happen to us, but I feel like now's not the time to be scared for some reason. I can't control what happens to me, only how I respond to it. And so that's the best thing that I can do for myself is be positive. Being inspired by her nurses, Lauren applied to nursing school. I'm going to nursing school and I'm interested in becoming a remodule nurse for other patients. One thing that happened was I was asleep and I woke up and it untwisted itself. And like I hit a part of my tube and it just dropped off. And so I knew it had become detached, flicked on the light looked in the mirror, saw that there was like blood all over my shirt. And from there, I got on FaceTime with my doctors. They told me what to do. Um, that's actually happened to me twice. There is fear that if this happens again, that it could be worse, fatal, which is why I wanted my dog. I decided to get my service dog because I'm going to a dorm, I'm gonna be alone with all my medical equipment, and so I thought, as a safety precaution, I wanted a dog to wake me up. So that's why I got Ruby, it's because of that whole bleeding situation. And there's usually like a long waiting list. It's usually like three to five years, and then it costs you like $35,000. I have a trainer that trains me to train my dog. So that was the quickest way for me to get a service dog. The total cost for Lauren's drugs is about $75,000 a month. This is $15,000. I use about four of these a month. Um, and then I have other oral drugs. This one is $10,000 a bottle. I'm not sure how many I use a month. I think one or two. I'm very fortunate to have California Child Care Services that covers the medical costs right now. Um, however, when I turn 21, 
that's kind of all up in the air. A lot of people get grants for their medications because insurance won't cover them. It's so much money because it's a very rare disease, so the drug companies are not going to make a whole lot of money on it because they have a very small control group of people that they sell it to. They can get away with selling it for that much, and they do. In order to cure my daughters, you're going to have to find a cure for the genetic mutation, which takes research and funding. If there's a cure out there, I believe that she can walk through it and stand for that. So I think that she has that warrior spirit inside of her, just like her father did. I believe that she'll be at the forefront of research, clinical trials, and therapies. And I think she works really, really hard on um, accepting things. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, we all have our really bad days and our really down days about it. Um, but I think on a whole, it's a strange thing to say, but I think she's embraced it. Okay, go. A lot of people push things into the future like, oh, I'll get to it eventually, like I'll learn to do this eventually. But for me, it's like, if I want to learn to do something, like now's the time to do it, and I do it now. I think that's a great thing, because even if I live a long time, like then I would have done all these amazing things, right? Because I didn't do it without inhibitions. And um, I think everyone should live that way, not just people who may have a shorter lifespan because then we'd have awesome lives. Not being afraid of what people think of us would be great. <laughs> Not being afraid of what others think of him is something 22-year-old Zion has become expert in. Being born without legs hasn't stopped me from doing the things that I want to do. People just, um, they'd make fun of me because I didn't have legs. The best way to deal with haters is to use the hate to lift yourself up. Your haters are your biggest fans, so use that to your advantage. Zion was born with a rare condition, causing him to be born without legs. But that's not the only thing that makes Zion's story so unique. I was born with caudal regression syndrome. It is a very rare disease. One out of every 100,000 kids are born with it each year. Caudal regression syndrome is a rare disease that can cause a number of abnormalities in a baby. Like, it can be, you have a portion of your spine missing, or in my case, I was born without legs. I lived most of my life through foster care until about 16. He came into my life when the caseworkers had reached out to me and said that they needed a placement for a young fellow. They bring Zion to my home some weeks later. Then it came to a point to where I just knew he was mine and I just was so in love with him. And I approached him one day on the couch and I said, Zion, I know that I'm not your biological mother. And, and I asked him if I could get to be his mom. He said, uh, yes, I want you to be my mom. I was like, well, let's do this, <laughs> let's do it. The relationship with my mom is fantastic. She is the greatest woman I know, you know, and she wants, the, well, she wants what's best for me. She wants what's best for me and my sisters. She never once was gonna give up on me. I mean, I was, I was always a, I was a troubled kid during school, so I mean, anything, any little thing would make me mad. I just got in trouble for punching lockers or just back talking to teachers, you know. Well, people just, um, they'd make fun of me because I didn't have legs, like they think I couldn't do something, or they'd be talking to me saying I wouldn't do something, and in turn I'd do it and get in trouble. Uh, but then, after a while, I just got tired of it, so I would, I'd stop reacting and I'd just let them talk and then eventually they started leaving me alone. Uh, school wasn't the greatest time for me, but by the time I was a senior, I was able to turn it around and get to college and start doing everything I wanted to do. I started wrestling in second grade. I could just go wrestle for a couple more hours, waste all my energy and go home and just go to sleep. When I was really little, the first few matches, I didn't know what to do and neither did my opponent. Kids, some kids were scared to wrestle me. I was scared to wrestle them. I didn't know what I was doing. I adapted my wrestling by a lot of trial and error. I spent years figuring out what would work, what didn't work, and there's a lot of things that don't work. But the things that do work, drill them over and over and over again until they're completely flawless, until somebody might know I'm doing it, but I'm gonna do it anyways, whether they want me to or not. I train about twice a day, every single day, about six days a week. And it's an everyday thing. It's a grind, it's a lifestyle. 
Zion was a very special athlete because he had perseverance and his determination was second to none. It was very easy for me to coach him with qualities like that. Very good takedown. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's get the breakdown. He has no legs, so he doesn't have any power for the bottom half of his body, which puts him at a great disadvantage for wrestling. I noticed that uh, because of his willingness to do the things that he needs to do to win, that I knew that we could come up with something to make him successful. How proud am I, Zion? Give me a Z. Z, you got your Z, you got your Z. I, know, I am proud. I'm his number one cheerleader. I told you I am the executive director of his fan club. I, I am very proud of him. How at first he was just so angry, but how he learned is each time to route that anger and to make it into something positive. Being born without legs hasn't stopped me from doing the things that I want to do. The best way to deal with haters is to use the hate to lift yourself up. Your haters are your biggest fans, so use that to your advantage. My dreams and ambitions, one day to make the Olympic team be one of the best uh, freestyle wrestlers in the world. I want to be able to go back home, tell my mom, like, mom, number one, there's nobody better. I'm going to try to keep getting better from there. I just want to be the best. The biggest lesson I've had to learn is that things will not always go your way, but you have to work with what you got. And once, you, once you're able to work with what you have, multiple doors will start to open. From being born without any legs, to being born with two bodies, two legs, and just one kidney and liver, Kendra and Malia are part of a minute number of twins, born conjoined. To get around, we do different things for different places. I think we adapted fully because we didn't ever have two legs. Yeah. So we don't have anything to run off of. We feel like we're, we're the same as everybody else. There's just a few things that are a little different. The best thing about having one leg each, like we only have to paint one set of toenails. So that's really nice. Yeah. Mostly little kids stare, but when adults stare at us, we kind of like, or like it's strange because they shouldn't They be. shouldn't, <laughs> they should know not to stare. It's rare to be a conjoined twin. The doctor said that we weren't gonna live past 24 hours, but after we passed that, they said that we would, wouldn't would live past eight sharing one kidney for the both of us. So that's why we got separated. The feeling of being attached to someone else is weird. Oh, Miss Kendra Dean's tired. Oh, there's Malia. She has an NJ tube because she doesn't eat very well. At four years old, Kendra and Malia's parents had a tough decision to make. Should they let their daughters have a life-threatening operation to separate them? It wasn't always just cut and dry that we were gonna separate them and that's all that there was to it. There's so much that goes into a huge decision like that. You have to make sure that it's the right thing for them. We went to a lot of different doctors, psychologists, anything that I could take them to just to make sure that they were ready and it wouldn't harm them. We just called it cut apart day. We didn't like understand. <laughs> really know what it meant. I said no, but you said no, Kendra Dean. Are you said no. When we got separated, Kendra got the kidney and then I went on dialysis for nine months until my mom donated her kidney. And then okay. 10 years after I got that kidney, it rejected and um, I went on dialysis. She was on dialysis for two and a half years. And so she would go three hours, three times a day. So it ended up being about four hours, three times a week. I have 56 minutes left already. <laughs> she just took it in stride. Um, she had friends on dialysis that had passed away and she had to deal with the loss of her friends, which was really hard. I'm just amazed at how well she, she did it. I don't think I could do it. When I get up in the morning, I get ready for school and then we get picked up by our friend and we go to school. High school's been good so far. Like, people are really nice. It's just harder if classes are far apart. But other than that, it's fun. 
Molly and I make dinner every night, so we switch off. So one of us will make dinner and then the other one do like homework or like whatever if we don't have homework. We like to film YouTube videos with this camera. We just got it. We just set up down here and we put this couch here and then we put our camera on a stand and then so on our YouTube channel we just do like different funny videos and like we did a video of our story. We were only three when my parents talked to us about separating us and I don't think we really understood what it meant. Well, we understood what it meant, but we didn't understand the risks of it. Because we were so young, we didn't know what dying was. We like doing fun stuff too. We like making the videos just like to make people positive, I guess. We like making them because we're weird. <laughs> and we like sharing our weirdness. I think social media has helped improve their confidence. And it gives something to drive them, something that they're really interested in. And they love coming to show us, Mom, look what this person said. And they were so excited that we, we responded to them. And I'm so glad that they have that in their life. The self-esteem that they have blows me away. Lots of people could learn a lot of things from them. We are happy that our parents at 20 years old, Michelle often gets mistaken for a child due to her unusual appearance that's a result of her incredibly rare condition. My name is Michelle Elizabeth Kish. I have a condition called Hellman's Grief Syndrome. It has 28 characteristics. I have 26 of them. The two that I don't have, I think, are brain problems or something. Yay! <laughs> I don't know, Mom knows more about this than I do. Dad's a spoiled sport. Michelle was born with Hallerman Streif syndrome, a condition so rare that at the time of her birth, there were only 250 known cases of it worldwide. The most annoying thing is being small because there's a lot of rice that I want to go on and like six wives and I can't because it has a stupid type restriction. Another annoying thing is that with my trick I can't go in the water because I like to be a mermaid. I like mermaids. When I was pregnant with Michelle, everything was normal. There was no um, issue at all through the pregnancy or through the delivery. Michelle was diagnosed by a geneticist. She had recognized the syndrome from pictures in her medical books, but no one had ever seen it in person. The fact that my child had a rare genetic disorder that was one in five million and occurred only every five generations, I was pretty much devastated. I do have to go into the hospital like a lot. I can't count how many times. Like a lot. It's like my second home basically. The symptoms of Hellerman Streif syndrome, the, the main ones are that it's a cranial facial disorder, bilateral cataracts, frontal bossing of the forehead, a recessed chin, small beak like nose, a small airway stenosed ear canals, and dental anomalies. Michelle also got some of the secondary characteristics like dwarfism, cardiomyopathy, chronic pulmonary lung disease, mitrogastria, fragile bones, um, skin atrophy, alopecia. Have I hit it all? I mean, there's... You've hit most of them, yeah. I can't think of any. Now Michelle is a 20-year-old young lady, smart as a whip, Happy, happy as ever. She's one of the happiest 20 year olds I know. My favorite things to do are playing on my computer, watching TV, playing on my iPad, playing with my dog, Piper. I got my dog three years ago. She's very cute. She's very lovable. She goes by me when I'm sick.
Michelle struggles the most without admitting it. She's lonely. This is the first time I've got a friend to help me. It's nice. A friendly wizard. Kids are nice to her, but she's never really developed friendships like, let's say, her older sister has or, or kids her own age. And she's just like any teenager, now young lady, 20-year-old. She wants a boyfriend. Have I ever had a boyfriend? No. But I want to really have... Because I'm already 20 and Sarah had her like, first boyfriend in high school. I would look for in a boyfriend, long hair. Period. When Michelle talks about wanting a boyfriend, uh, it's interesting. I tell her that it's not all it's cracked up to be. It's kind of sad that, you know, it's, I want her to have that same experience, but also she's very, very confident and she's a very strong, independent human. Michelle was sick a lot when we were younger, so we didn't get to hang out as much, but as we grew up, right, we hung yeah. out more? Yeah. Do we ever annoy each other? Do we? Do we? I think sometimes, like Maybe. normal sister stuff, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Food stinks. Food stinks? Yeah. This is um, Sophia, as Michelle calls it, instead of a ventilator. It's not so medical. Okay. Michelle puts her own ventilator on. Sophia. Sophia, so now she'll be on it for an I hour. Get on so get off at 4.02. Okay. Oh, Oops. Pop goes a family. So good. My dream job is be a pediatric doctor in a year. <laughs> and I got two backup jobs just in case they don't work. I want to be a fashion designer like on my favorite computer game, Barbie's Fashion Show. And I want to be an actress. Every time I introduce Michelle to a new friend, they immediately think she's really sassy and really funny. Um, but they I'm love that about you. I'm not sassy. Oh, you're very sassy. No, I'm not. Okay, okay. But they love that about you, um, and they end up liking you more than me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Michelle's long-term outlook or prognosis is unknown at this point. Um, we've had several close calls. Overall, she's fairly healthy with all the maintenance. She's just a happy child, young lady. She's tough as nails. I think I'm different from the average 20 year old, but that's okay. Four year old Isla is the only one in the world born with the mutation she has of her condition. This is Isla, she's age four. Isla's got a very cheeky personality, haven't you? Yes, you have. Yes, you have, you cheeky girl. Oh, look Amazing. at that. Beautiful. Sasa, fun air, she knows what she wants. Wow, that's good. We were given the diagnosis um, the October after she was born um, that she had a condition called mandibular acral dysplasia, but the mutation that they'd found they'd never seen before. So they were unable to give us any answers. Um, all that they could tell us is that it affects bone growth and premature aging of her major organs, so like her heart, kidneys, everything like that. And we were told that she could be, you know, uh, at risk of strokes from as young as seven. We have no one that we can compare Isla with. She's the only one in the world with this mutation. So there's, there's just no one, no one like Isla. This is her breakfast. So Isla has oral intake as well, but she doesn't eat enough calories. Ready? <laughs> You're doing it. <laughs> we have uh, a number of different specialists that are involved in Isla's life. Uh, so it's pretty full on with appointments. It was just a case of trying to make sure that we just made life as normal as possible. We hate that word, don't we? Normal. It doesn't bother her that she's got a tracheostomy. It doesn't matter that she's got a, a you know, she's tube fed. She knows why and she knows that it, it helps her life. And you're still cheeky with your sister, aren't you? <laughs> are you cheeky to Paige? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Right, should we get dressed then? Should we go to the park? 
I suppose the main thing that you can, you worry about is is it going to affect her life expectancy and that's that's the worst one so it's part of the reason why we try and just live life as as we can and to the fullest because we don't know what's going to happen and as rubbish as that sounds it's true I just wanted to make sure that no matter what happens we had videos between both of the girls and memories it's just to make sure that those memories are always there I just don't want to be without her None of us do. So that's the hardest. And I suppose one of the things that you just try not to think about. Unfortunately, some of you think about Dayla. Shall we pass me some tissue, please? <laughs> Mummy's fine. Scary man. It was during lockdown. Isla's sister wanted her own TikTok. We said, right, let's set one up because she wanted to do it as well. You know, sisters being sisters, one can't do something without the other. So then we just started doing it, making little silly dance videos and it just took off. It's literally just videos of the girls and just living the life. And obviously people like it. <laughs> what do I need to do? When we first started TikTok, because we were talking about the premature aging, they just went with the Benjamin Button because it's premature aging, but I suppose in the reverse. It definitely drew people's attention to it. Most people thank us for sharing Isla's life with them. We have had the odd hate comment, and I think at first that was hard for me to, first of all, understand why you'd want to say such horrible things to, about a kid. But now it just gets ignored because unfortunately it's just the world. 99% of it is positive and, you know, we appreciate it. Right, come on then. Should we go and get some lunch? She's made such changes in our life that actually we're only thankful for her and what she's brought to us. Three, one, go! I try my hardest to envision the future and Isla always being in, in it. It's Paige's little sister and I hope they give me mischief for many years to come. See, everyone wants to be a TikTok superstar. I just think it's just worked in such a positive way. I know it's not always positive experience for everyone. You make a lot of people smile though, don't you? Yeah? And you make a lot of people happy. And it's because you're such a brave little girl, aren't you? So should we t say thank you to everybody? Yeah? Go on then, see. what do we say? <laughs> thank you, everybody. Yeah? 23-year-old Carly has a rare connective tissue disease called fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, which causes muscles, tendons, and ligaments to turn to bone. Right hip is locked, um, so I stand like a flamingo, but my foot doesn't reach the ground all the way, which is why I walk with a limp. Um, so when I stand, I just have really good balance. For me, it's more comfortable because if I were to stand like with two feet, I would stand like this. Because her hips locked. Isn't very helpful. So it's easier because I can stand straight and then talk to someone. Whereas if I stood with both feet on the ground, I'd be talking to the ground. Not often do you need to talk to the ground. <laughs> the first thing to go was there was a lot of swelling in my back that has caused that over time to just turn into a sheet of bone. I have progressively lost more movement in my shoulders and neck um, to at this point where I have almost none. So Carla can't bend at her waist. She cannot raise her arms over her head. Luckily, she still has movement that she can get to her mouth, but I help her with her earrings. I help her shower. I do her hair. Put her shoes on, and we drive her places that she needs to go. FOP is one of the rarest known diseases, affecting approximately only 800 people worldwide. So I was diagnosed with FOP at five and a half. I took a really bad fall in 2001 off of the back of a bar stool um, and had a lot of swelling. Next day we went to the doctor. When we brought Carly in, to have her looked at, that's when Dr. Schmidt looked at us and said, you know, I, I just want to see her feet. The genetic mutation causes big toes to be malformed and sometimes a joint is missing completely. He looked at her feet and said, you know, I think I know what this is. He wrote it, he wrote it on a piece of paper and said, you know, there'll be some specialists you'll have to see. 
basically, that's when we found out. Success. It can be triggered by a fall, um, or even something as little as a paper cut can trigger new bone to form. And sometimes it's nothing at all. I could fall today and nothing would happen. But if I took the same fall another day, it could cause me to lose mobility. So it just, it kind of depends on what wakes up the FOP beast, as we like to call it. The condition progresses in spurts. These kids tend to go through a time period where there are a lot of flare-ups. We're not really sure why. There's some suspicion that hormonal events that happen um, during adolescence may be a trigger. So Carly lives a little differently because it's difficult for her to be on her own, right? She's a young woman um, who would probably like her independence and the ability to get out and do things on her own and her disease doesn't allow her to do that. At just seven years old, Carly's jaw locked and now she can't open her mouth more than two millimeters. They took eight teeth out so I can get food through the holes, as I like to call them. Um, but it's definitely harder to chew. If there was a sport, I was in it, and I was the center of attention. I just loved everything about being active. So I remember my parents having to slow me down a lot. They never treated me any different. She was on the swim team. She wasn't very good. Uh, but she competed anyways, um, and uh, you know, and everyone cheered her on. It didn't matter. It wasn't what it was about. It was about her just being her. So we are actually really lucky for such a rare disease. We have a couple amazing doctors on the case. You go, and then I go, and then my dad goes, and then this my is tragic. <laughs> I am ruining this. I'm about to lose it right now. This is actually so tragic. It's stuck in there. There's drugs that will hopefully prevent bone from forming because of a flare-up. That's the drug that Carly is on right now as a clinical trial. Where we're at today versus where we were 15 years ago, just amazing. <laughs> so this is the piece of bone that is causing my jaw to lock. Um, which is why I have no movement. And hopefully in the coming years with FOP treatment, they will be able to remove that cord of bone, um, giving me mobility back in my jaw. <laughs> the life expectancy of someone with FOP is just 40 years old, and there is currently no cure. However, there are multiple clinical trials looking into FOP, promising treatments and potential cures. Carly went to three different colleges, mm -hmm. Finally graduated from Maryville. I went to Drury in Springfield, Missouri. Sometimes Carly will like curl my hair for me and French braid it. Carly has been with her boyfriend Billy for six years. We decided to move in together. Um, that one was actually instigated by me. Um, she caught me off guard. <laughs> there we go. I decided it was kind of the right time for me to venture out on my own while I still could. We're hoping in the next two or three weeks to be moved in here. Um, there was no real modifications that we made in here. We just are going to be careful about where we put the dishes and other things in the kitchen to be able to be at a level to where I can reach them. So here we have the bathroom. This we had to completely gut. And then we also have a bench that I can sit on and also use to put shampoo and conditioner so that I can reach it. I'm pretty excited. It's been a journey. I'm going to be happy when it's over. I'm just excited to get into my new home and see where my independence can take me. From muscles that turn to bone, to a condition that causes bones to disappear throughout the body, 14-year-old Natalia has an incredibly rare condition called idiopathic multicentric osteolysis. This means that I'm tired a lot because it's all my bones are like putting pressure on something. Good boy. Or that the skin and the muscle are basically working to keep all my extremities together 
So the more I use them, the more I'll be in pain and tired. The condition is so rare, there have been less than 100 cases reported worldwide. This means very little is known about it, and there is no treatment or cure. Basically, her body is absorbing the calcium from her bones and essentially making them disappear. So Natalia, she's got no carpal bones, no tarsal bones, and it affects the smaller bones first. There's just severe deterioration in her knees. Um, her shoulders and her elbows are basically held together by just the soft tissue around there, the nerves. She's had a motorized wheelchair since she's been in first grade. About 2013, it was getting very difficult for me to carry Natalia. So we decided to add on to the house and put the wheelchair lift in to at least give her the access to her bedroom with her chair and give her some independence. We cut her food for her so that she can, again, be independent and feed herself to the extent that she can. Even if I'm having a tough day, I feel like I want to push through it because I don't want the pain to impact like my mom's like quality of my life. I just want my life to be as normal as possible. It does get a little frustrating, but I think I've just been able to figure out a different way to be independent. Something that distracts me is art. I like digital art, so I love drawing on my iPad, because it's sometimes easier than drawing on paper, which gets me a little tired. She's very uh, stubborn, but in a good way. She sticks her own, to her own path. She doesn't let you deter her from what she wants to do. And sometimes she is right. She's creative. She does a lot of drawing work. And she's strong with what she goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's hard knowing what she deals with and like all the pain. Uh, my mom works from home three days a week, so she usually helps me in the morning. And then my dad usually helps me get my breakfast and then takes me to school. I greet her at the door, open the door for her. Oh, Natalia. Of course, she prefers to be independent, and I'll let her be independent unless she tells me she needs some assistance. Do I do a new file? Mm -hmm. uh, Natalia is a great student. Um, she does uh, very, very high level work, works very, very hard, and one of our best students. In addition to causing bones to disappear, IMO is also associated with fatal kidney failure. In order to monitor the condition and help with her pain, Natalia makes regular visits to specialist doctors. Dr. Smith helps me with all the problems that my bones are having. So like at the moment I'm having shoulder pain. They haven't really figured out a solution for most of my pain. But there's still no answer to relieve the pain, it's just more of managing her pain at this point. Hello. Hi, Dr. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? How are you, Natalia? <laughs> How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good? Good. And how has your uh, pain and stuff been lately? I think, uh, like, I think the normal, like I've been telling you, like the shoulder and the back pain. Right. This is a very rare condition. Uh, we've only seen a few cases, and, and each child is, is specific. Well, I've been following Natalia since she was three years old, and it's actually poorly understood. And how has your neck been? the same and still feels like it's ready to drop because it feels like a it's like a bowling ball and I had like the weight. Yeah, yeah. Is it all, all day or yeah it's all day. All day so sometimes when it gets tiring to sit up. So. We've tried different kinds of medications uh, to treat it and um, other complicated aspects of this disease. For us we expect that uh, she might have some progression of her 
of her disease, but she should always uh, be fairly functional in her chair. We are working with different kinds of adaptive uh, things so that she can become a productive uh, adult. Natalia may be limited in the things she's able to do, but she's determined to find ways to enjoy life. I think that one there. They can go out. Or we can start the first round and then. Yeah, that's Oh, wait, I can't go. Um, I like bowling because it sort of gives me a place to put all my stuff, life struggles into and I don't have to focus on anything else and I can sort of get out of it while I'm bowling. Okay, I'm going to put the V on the top. Even though like that may, people may be struggling with this condition, I feel like you should never let it affect you because there's more to you than this disease. The penultimate rare condition we'll be looking at is Prader-Willi syndrome, a condition that causes people with it to have an insatiable hunger. My name is Camille and I'm 23 years old. When Cammie was born, she wouldn't take the bottle. She couldn't really suck very well. When the nurse came to us, she mentioned that something was wrong with Camille. They decided that they needed to take her into the natal intensive care unit where um, they were able to feed her through the feeding tube and they needed to do some testing and so forth. When you were uh, three months old, we got the diagnosis from that genetics testing that you had Prader-Willi syndrome. It was something that uh, we weren't ready for. It affects one in 12, 15,000 people. Uh, there are uh, learning dif disabilities. Uh, there's anxiety, obsessive compulsive behaviors. The main thing that comes along with it is an insatiable appetite. Uh, there's low muscle tone. They don't burn calories the same way as somebody else would. Each morning uh, when I get up, I have to disarm the alarm system so that I don't wake the whole house up. The reason uh, that we have to lock things up is to keep Camille out of the kitchen. Um, we have just an alley kitchen, so it's easy to have a framed in door with a locking system. And it was um, around the age of 10 that we noticed uh, that there was uh, food seeking going on. Five. I'm sorry, five. I went into uh, one morning to get my sandwich out of the refrigerator to leave for work in the morning, and I noticed that a bite had been taken out of it. And then uh, the second thing was uh, Kim made a tray of cinnamon buns, and they went missing. It was at that moment that, we were, that the light bulb went on. Imagine uh, smashing your thumb with a hammer and telling yourself not to feel any pain. Uh, that's how I kind of think about it with Camille with, as far as hunger. Like, it's just impossible for her not to feel that. Camille uh, is really quick when there's food uh, accessible. Um, we have nicknamed her the Stealth Ninja as a result. You turn your back for a split second, if there's something left out, uh, she could quickly put it in her pocket or take it and run to her room. Not that long ago, um, we forgot to set the alarm at night when um, I left for work that morning, I noticed that the trash can was knocked over and I thought it was due to the raccoons. And then um, later that morning, my wife texted me and, and said that she had found a pizza box behind Cammie's bed. Camille is on a diet of about 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day. Normally it would be like um, two ounces of plain grilled chicken or something like that. She always has a cup of vegetable, a cup of fruit, and a cup of jello. I like my my jello, having my jello. <laughs> it makes me feel really good that they take care of me all the time. We have to basically not eat around her. I can get away with it a little more because I'm the older brother. If my parents or my brother spring out a snack, she'll be asking, why does he have that? Or when can I get something? When I do eat, 
I have to make sure when I'm done with it, it goes in the trash or else she'll take it right away. It, it's hard feeling hungry all the time. It gives me anxiety. We have pinpoint of anxiety medication and depression medication and um, some mood stabilizers. Routine uh, does help lower anxiety levels. Monday through Friday, she goes to a program during the day from 8 to 2. Come on, Cam. We're going to take Lulu for a walk. Let's get your coat on. Prader-Willi syndrome is um, what Camille lives with. Uh, it's the diagnosis that she's been given, but it certainly does not define her. Um, she is so much more than that. She's loving, caring, kind, uh, compassionate, giving. If you have some sort of animal, she'll never forget the story you tell about it or the, or the animal's name. We really just want for her to be happy, but for her that's going to take a bit more from us and from the community for that to happen. The more that we can share our story with others, the more that we hope to be able to educate other people and let, let people know that yes, it's, it's going to be difficult, but it's going to be okay. Our final story is about Natalie, who has one of the rarest cases of her condition. The doctors has told me that I'm one of 20 people in the whole world that has ichthyosis confetti. Ichthyosis is a rare skin condition, which means that my skin is healing by itself. So this is my plastic bath, uh, bath uh, tub. So we don't have the space uh, for a normal bathtub, so I bought a plastic one because I need it for my skin. And yeah, so I use it a few times a week. Maybe five hours. Uh, I have uh, my computer, so I watch a movie, drink a cup of tea. I have uh, candle lights, candles all over the bathroom. So I make it a spa time while bathing. The symptoms is for example itchiness, dryness, stiffness, pain because I'm, I haven't put on cream and I'm very dry and that makes it like just by like doing this with my hands can hurt or waking up and going up from bed. I have to plan before doing anything because everything takes such a long time to make myself ready. <laughs> my skin routine takes a lot of time. I remember when I was younger, people always thought it was contagious and that's something that I really didn't like because I could feel the f afraidness that people felt coming near me. But once when I was at a wa water park, uh, I wasn't allowed to be there uh, because of my skin condition. They thought that people there wouldn't like to be bathing at the same swimming pool or I don't know. I looked like this and I'll always be looking like this, but I'm not contagious, so you don't have to be afraid. <laughs> uh, Natalie, what are you going to do today? My name is Siri and I'm Natalie's cousin. Are you going to take any photographs today? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, so Pablo is coming, uh, my photographer. We will meet up at the cafe at Hongongen and then He'll come and then he'll take some pictures of me. I've always just seen her as who she is and not like that she looks different. I've always had Natalie next to me. It surprises me sometimes when some people react and some people react like in a rude way and that's not okay. Uh, what are you gonna do today? Uh, well, I thought I was gonna hang out with you. I don't have a lot of plans. <laughs> I'm just gonna tag along. <laughs> tag along. I'm very happy for Natalie for getting into, into modeling. She deserves to do something that makes her happy. And I think it's good for other people to see how much courage Natalie has. And she, she really like, shows the world who she is. And I think it's very brave. Hello. Hello, how are you? This is the third time I shoot with Natalie. Uh, she contacted me before the summer, uh, around April, uh, and she was in, in need of like getting some material with high quality because she wanted to pursue this dream of being a model or, or trying that, that to, to break, disrupt 
that market, let's say, uh, with her special condition, and she was trying to show her beauty, um, and I tried to help her to do that. I've done some uh, campaign commercial jobs. I really love to do it because I feel more confident and I also want to inspire people because no one should hide because they look different. She has evolved quite a lot. Uh, the first shoot was uh, with her family around, uh, so she could feel a bit more uh, uh, safe and secure. And the second photo shoot, we work a lot on, on kind of like how to move the body, the face, and how to get different postures. She has a natural talent for it. I've got a lot of nice comments actually like oh you're such an inspiration or oh you look beautiful oh your skin looks so fascinating and beautiful with all that with all the different patterns and colors and it's so beautiful and that i'm strong i love my skin because that's because it makes me unique special if anyone had a problem with my with my appearance uh, I would tell them that I don't feel bad about it, so why should you? And if you don't accept it, then that's your problem.